you have to have uh, a real confidence that you can really bring something new to the to the table. Hello and welcome to The New Rules of Work, a podcast from The Muse where we explore the changing landscape of work. This season, we've talked with leaders about how the world of work is changing and how they're helping their companies adapt and set a new standard. Now today, I'm really excited to speak with another accomplished leader, one whose personal career story I think many listeners will be able to relate to. Cesar Ruiz is a seasoned advertising pro, and he currently leads a 65-person team focused on digital search and native advertising at Microsoft. But he didn't start out in advertising, as we'll discuss. Caesar, welcome to the new rules of work. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I'm Thanks doing great. Me. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to have you on the episode today. And um, I really want to dig in and share a little bit more of your story with our listeners, because I think it's really instructive, um, you know, as 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 we're all thinking about uh, nonlinear career paths. And so as I mentioned in the intro, you didn't start your career in advertising, right? And in fact, you originally planned to go to law school, if I remember that correctly. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's correct. So as I was in college, I mean, like many of us, at least where I came from, um, we didn't have a lot of guidance, right? And so for me, uh, when I was in school, it was the easiest thing was either go to law school, go to go um, work on Wall Street, uh, or be a doctor, right? And for me, it was like, okay, law school sounds like something that I can do. Um, I like, you know, just reading up on certain legal terms and those types of things. So it was sort of a natural for me. Um, and it was around my sophomore, junior year, right in between those two years that I realized this is not at all what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was really difficult to make that shift at that time. And, you know, my, my counselor advised me not to shift careers or to shift majors at that point. And so I stuck with it. And I ended up graduating with with a degree in political science, which is interesting because it's pretty useless for me now. I mean, um, same with my degree, and, actually. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know where I would use it except you know if I if I if I have to you know defend myself in some cases. But but really, it, it was it was there that I that I started the conversation around. I I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and you know it was a, it was a job, and I sort of started there. Um, and it was at that point about a year in that I said, this is definitely not at what I wanted to do for my career. So, um, I did the craziest thing that I would say, you know, a, a young 21 year old could do is I literally quit working for the United States government and looked for a regular job. Um, and then that's when I had some friends that worked in, uh, in the finance industry and wall street. Um, and they had kind of guided me to, to certain jobs, very, very entry level career jobs, um, and I started my career working uh, first at Prudential Securities, and then I moved on to Citigroup. And that's really where I started my my finance route, left the legal behind and started the, the finance route there. And I was working for Citigroup um, at Seven World Trade. And, and that's essentially where I kicked off what I would say my career was. And I remember when we talked before, you said that you were actually in the office at Seven World Trade Center on 9-11. Is that right? 40th floor of Seven World Trade. Quite full day, we um, we were sitting in the in the trading floor. Um, I had an office that was set up um, about two offices down from the what would be considered the corner office. Um, but I was typically in the trading area because I had a, a small team that I that I managed. And um, I essentially, when we felt the shock for uh, you know we you know we didn't know what it was, but somebody had screamed out that that we had that there was a bomb or something with you know. The, something had happened in the building, the person who yelled out that it was a bomb had been there in 91, or was it 91 when it was the, the, uh, the other uh, explosion that happened in the, in the basement? Um, 93, I think, so they yeah. thought it was, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so they kind of thought it was immediately, they thought it was the same thing. And so we all started running down the stairs and, and, uh, and heading down to the main lobby. Um, and then we were in Seven World Trade, which ironically was also the headquarters for the FBI. Um, and when we got to the lobby, uh, the FBI, you know, they had a bunch of their folks there with their FBI jackets on and trying to direct people into different areas. And we were just sitting there and seeing everything as it's happening. Um, and as we were there, I don't know it's what felt like forever. We felt the second uh, uh, impact um, at that point. Believe it or not, some people were being sent back upstairs by security uh, you know most of the, the my my team and the folks that we were with decided to stay there and then when we felt the second shock then we ultimately ran out um, and left through the loading dock 
Wow. So, I mean, yeah, what, quite an adventure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what ended up happening to your office and your colleagues? Um, we lost two colleagues that were meetings in, in the other buildings. So it was a little emotional for some of us. City Group got us um, counseling. So we had counseling for a good year after that. But we didn't actually return back to work for about a month and a half. And they relocated the office. Or at least our team was relocated up to Stanford, Connecticut. At the time, I was living in, um, in Hackensack, New Jersey. So I was commuting back and forth from Hackensack to, to Stanford, which was quite a commute in of, of our our team and the office and everything sort of changed for for everyone there. And I think most people were interested in getting out of there because the option was they would relocate us to Stanford um, and gave us, I forget what the amount was. It wasn't, it wasn't very much. I want to say it was like 25,000 that they gave every employee if they wanted to relocate to the Connecticut area, or they would just give you that to to absorb it into your commute. Um, Most people decided to stay where they lived because they didn't plan on staying in Connecticut forever. And which is what I did. I, I think I stuck it out for about, I want to say it was about a year and a half or so. And then that's when I started to get the itch to go and do something else. And that's where essentially I, I transitioned into a different career, but which I, I think we'll get into. But uh, yeah, it was. It, I probably spent a year and a half commuting from, from New Jersey to Connecticut. And it was the, the worst experience <laughs> of my life in terms of commuting. I mean, I think a bad commute can really ruin a a great job. And it's, it's one of the reasons why I often advise people to, you know, really think about um, some of the logistics and the more tactical things about your career. Cause it really does make a big difference. And so, you know, from there, where did you go? Did you do a switch right away? Did you do, you know, additional education? How did you think about making that next shift? Yeah. So while I was there, um, I really, you know, again, this is, this would have been now my my third career shift, essentially, right? Because I, I started in the law legal uh, space. Um, so I was really, at that point, I was becoming a little bit more uh, aware in, in the sense that it's not that easy to just keep crossing, you know, into different industries and all that. And so one of the, again, going back to my my connections and friends that I had from school, um, I had a bunch of friends that had started working in the advertising in the digital space. Um and, I, and, you know, they had to, well, why don't you consider jobs in advertising or digital? Uh, digital was very, very, very in the early stages at that point. Um, so they advised me to take a course down at uh, NYU that was offering a digital certificate class, which was very basic. Uh, but it just introduced me to that space because, you know, we didn't we barely even used computers right? when we were at Citigroup. I mean, it was just these very basic stations that we use for trading, but nothing really uh, much more than that. Um, and so I, I started going to this, to this training, uh, the certificate class at NYU. And that's where I met, um, a person who ultimately became my mentor, um, who, you know, while we were going, it was, a, it was about an eight week program that I went, you know, I kept going back and I think it was twice a week. And, um, I met him and he sort of guided me through the process of, of figuring out a way to leverage my experience in a leadership role, uh, from the finance industry into, um, an advertising space, right? And so what he did is um, he was a GM at the Chicago Tribune, um, helped me uh, with a couple of interviews at a couple of places, including the Chicago Tribune. Um, and they gave me an opportunity to work. Uh, you know, I went through an interview and, and, and I was able to go in, not as a manager, but as, a, as an IC in a, in a more senior uh, capacity doing business development. So uh, what happened is they, uh, Newsday launched a Spanish language newspaper. I speak Spanish and Portuguese. And so there was an opportunity for me to, uh, uh, to take on a role leading uh, their, what they consider their Spanish language newspaper, leading a team, actually launching a team, building it out. Um, it was a team of about 20, I want to say it was like 20, 22 people that they were going, uh, considering hiring. So I basically jumped over to that side I didn't know anything about the Hispanic or multicultural space, but I knew I had learned a little bit around advertising and print was something that I picked up fairly quickly. So that's what I did. I, I made the jump over to um, running that team, built it out. And that's what I what I would say is that my career, my leadership career started off now in the advertising space. Uh, and so, yeah, so that was that was at that point um, a, a, a good crossover for me because it was now I was managing again. Um, I had learned a little bit about advertising, but not quite enough where I was as seasoned as some of the people that I, that I managed. 
but I've, but I leaned a lot on what I had learned. Um, I had really great leaders in my career uh, across the board, and I had learned a lot around leadership, and, and that's where I leaned a lot on to, to help me through, I would say, the, the early six months, eight months that transition, those onboarding months. Um, yeah, and then I think that was really the kickoff for me in, in the advertising space. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think this is one of the things that's so interesting about your career path. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is, you know, you started in law, then you went into finance, then print and digital advertising, then television and sports, you know, how then did you make the transition to Microsoft? And, um, you know, when you contemplated such a leap, you know, something that I've struggled with is, is imposter syndrome. You know, did you ever doubt whether you could do the job? Absolutely. Yeah. I I had a lot of doubt. Um, it was, you know, every career, I've had four different jobs in the advertising space and every single one of them, I was going into a completely different industry. So I started in the print, print specific, then print digital. Then I went to television, as you, as you alluded to with, with ESPN, uh, and then uh, continued more on the television OTT space with digital added as a, as a layer there. Um, and so one of the things that I always did uh, is to keep myself sort of in, in visibility. I I would like to, uh, I always wanted to be part of Ad Week or different events where there was uh, possible speaking opportunities. And so um, a couple of years back, I had heard uh, the person who is now my boss, I had heard him on a panel uh, speaking um, during Ad Week and I really connected with him and we had a, a you know, just a, a something that I felt really connected to. So it was when I heard him speak, I looked up at some of the Microsoft career uh, opportunities. Not, there was nothing uh, that I thought was anything that I could do at the time, but I was kept connected to it. And then uh, by chance, about a year and a half later, I applied to a role that seemed like something that I can do because their descriptions don't really make a ton of sense even now on the inside. I still don't think they make sense for anyone outside. So we're working on revising some of those, but um, I, I applied for a job, and ironically, I got called by a recruiter uh, from Microsoft, and it turns out uh, the first person that I met with was this person, Rob Wilk, who was the uh, the person that I had seen on the panel uh, a few years before. Um, what I can tell you is that uh, as we were going through the interview process, he explained to me that it was a search role. Um, one of the things that he was open to was someone who didn't have search but he wanted someone who was strong leadership and who could bring a really fresh perspective to the role. Um, and so, but he did say it's, it's a, it's a role where most of the people that work at Microsoft at the time, he, he oversaw a team of about 260. Um, I would say 95% of the people in that role were search is, you know, born and bred in, in search, right. From the very beginning. And so it was already a, a challenging environment to go into. So yeah, I, I, I at the time I was like, I'm going to go through this because I, I was never afraid of the challenges. But once I got the job, then I said, how am I actually going to do this? I mean, is this uh, search was this a foreign language? It's not uh, in the advertising space. You can sort of connect print, uh, digital. Uh, you can you can connect television. They all work on you know, cost per thousands and, and CPMs and CPCs and CPAs. So a lot of these things that were very common to me when I got to, you know, to, to explore more about the search world, it was just a, just a completely different language, something I had to really uh, be comfortable with. Um, and he yeah. gave me a lot of confidence. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was difficult, but I would say that um, he gave me the space to, you know, to pick that up and, and give myself the time and leverage the strength that I was bringing. Uh, but it was, it was extremely challenging, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, in that vein, now that you're managing such a large team, when you bring on new people, um, how do you help them manage through their own imposter syndrome? What, what um, advice do you have either for individuals or for managers who are thinking about how to, you know, how to help combat that and people on their teams? You know, I think, I, I think the one thing that people forget is that you, your experiences were in anywhere in your career, um, you've acquired some some really, I, I would call it institutional knowledge and, and skills and, and things that perhaps, um, you know, others don't have. And, and the reality is that you have to feel confident that, uh, that those, are those that are translatable, that you can relate to the current role that you might be picking up. Um, and so when I have, I've hired now a, a few people that have come from outside of search and, and really the advice is, you know, 
be comfortable that, you know, one, you got to humble yourself, right? Because you have to go in understanding that you don't know everything. You may be a 15 year veteran in the advertising space or the digital space, but you're, uh, you have basically no experience in the search space. So you're going to have to lean on people that are either, um, much younger than you are, have a lot more experience in search. And you, in your mind, you think I know more than they do, but I think it's first, you got to humble yourself. Second, you have to have uh, a real confidence that you can really bring something new to the, to the table. That to me was the biggest thing. And that's the one that the one thing that I think helped me in my transition was the ability to bring just something new that um, when I, I started to, to notice that uh, probably two or three weeks in, I noticed that they, when I would have meetings, when I would speak my, my truth, um, people would, would look at me and said, you know, that's, that's interesting. We've never looked at it that way. And, and it was, it was valued by my leadership team and my peers. And I think that's what helped me. Had, I think had I dealt with an experience where people looked at me and said, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I think it would have made it a lot more difficult. So I, I would say my experience was a, a good one. Um, I've had experiences with some that we've hired that haven't been as great. Um, and so I think it perhaps is at the level that you come in makes it even more challenging. But but if, if you go in and you're humble and you have an open mindset to learn, even though you've been in the space 20 plus years, um, then I think there's the ability to succeed in whatever capacity you go into. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think it's so true um, because you know, you can, you can have more versus less relevant experience, but nobody knows everything. And the more that you are open to that, I think the, um, the easier it is to, as you said, to really be humble and build those relationships and, and learn what you don't know. And so I guess in, in closing, I want to circle back to something that you said earlier, um, which was around mentorship. And, yeah. you know, it sounds to me like you were, you were lucky enough to find a really incredible mentor at a time when you were figuring out how to change industries, what you wanted, you know, and, and we're looking to do something different. So how do you approach mentorship today? I mean, for me personally, I always look to, um, I, I don't, I, I still have the one mentor that I always go to. And I think he just gives me just overall, he is like my godfather, I call him, because he just gives me advice from a personal standpoint and gives me advice from a, from a work standpoint. But but in, even in my career now at Microsoft, I've been there um, just about two years. Um, I, I, I like to, to emulate and think about folks that do things that I, you know, either that I don't have the ability to do, or, or at least I haven't gotten to that place yet. And I, and I use, usually lean on them for those types of things. So my approach to mentorship, at least for me personally, is I would go to uh, someone do I, that I see doing something exceptionally well. Um, I would typically let them know that, and you know, I appreciate the way that you managed that meeting, or I appreciate the way that you solved this issue. Um, and I typically would ask them. I mean, I would love your your guidance and mentorship in helping me get there. Um, a similar situation, you know, I could speak to that's actually real is um, one of the things that we do uh, uh, every six months at Microsoft is we have people conversations. So as a leadership team, we get together, we talk about the entire org. Um, so there'll be uh, my my four peers in North America, and the peers that I have in in uh, in Germany and in, in the UK, and we all get in a room with our boss, and we're talking about every single person on our organization. Um, and so at that point, we're talking about promotions, we're talking about all the different things that we're you know we're looking to do for our people, whether someone's uh, uh, outperforming, someone's not performing. And I and one of the, the, the my counterparts from the UK is exceptionally well at articulating um, someone who was going to get a promo, um, and that was one where I, I specifically said uh, I don't even know how you are, were able to articulate that, but it was bulletproof. There was no there were no holes in that uh, example of you wanting to promote that director that you have, and so for, I've been leaning on her to to see if there's a way that we can partner so she can help me do that a lot better, right? And so. I look at opportunities like that. I don't know that I go the full route of like, I need a mentor to check in every single week, but I look for opportunities for someone to mentor me through a specific example. Yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, you sort of touched on this, but I found that some of the best, most powerful mentors in my life are 
at a similar level or peers. And, and of course, like I've also had some incredible mentors who are, you know, much more experienced, much more successful and can help yeah. bring me up. But there's also so much you can learn from people at your same level, or even sometimes people that you think you might be mentoring. And then it turns out that they're, uh, right. you know, that, that they're really helping you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we, we do, we, we have a, at Microsoft, we have a reverse mentor program. Um, so I'm, I participate in that where I'll have someone who is junior to me, um, you know, who is typically looking for guidance into getting into a leadership role. Uh, and then for me, it helps me because I'm learning the day to day of what the, the ICs are dealing with um, on a regular basis. So it really does help me. Um, but mentorship to me in general, um, I, I, partic- I have a special interest in, in mentoring um, people who I see that have that, that potential or just some that, that are just have that untapped potential that they don't even realize they have. So I typically would just, you know, uh, handpick those to, to kind of have discussions with and they turn into mentorship. So I have people that seek me out particularly because we have a very small amount of, uh, you know, call it leaders of, of color uh, and at Microsoft. I mean, it's a, it's a challenge that we're, we're working through as an organization. And so the, the, uh, the employees that are, either Hispanic or, or uh, African-American or what have you, they typically come to me. They feel a lot more comfortable coming to me and asking me for, for my guidance in terms of, you know, how did you get here? What did you do? What things should I be doing? How do I stand out? And so I, I spend a lot of time with, with individuals having those discussions. And it's a little draining because, you know, we do have quite a bit of uh, a number of employees in, at that level that are of color. And so uh, it tends to get a bit overwhelming and I don't ever want to turn anyone away because I honestly never had that uh, mentorship going through my early part of the career. I just, I kind of figured it all out on my own. Um, And I would have loved to have had that um, much earlier in my career because I feel like things perhaps, I mean, I don't even know if I would have been in advertising, but, but I do wish that I would have had someone guiding and coaching me through, through my, through my steps in my, in my work career. Yeah, I I feel the same. And it's funny when um, when I first raised capital for the muse, there weren't that many other women who had raised capital, you know, seed, series A, series B. And so um, I still get a lot of inbound, but I got even more in the early days when there were just fewer women who had done it. And like you, I felt like, you know, I I felt like it was important to spend that time. But at the same time, um, you know, it's a balance because you still have to to do your job. And so I think that um, I like what you said about looking to invest the most um, in mentoring people who seem like they have that potential and are willing to put in the time and effort and lean in right. to make the most of it. I think that's some um, that's something I've definitely looked for as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I know we're we're out of time, um, but Caesar, thank you so much for uh, for this conversation. I think there's so many lessons from your career path, and I, I love the um, you know the way that that you talked about imposter syndrome too, because it's, I would say, you know, pretty much everyone deals with that. I I think about it all the time and, um, and it was, it was awesome to hear some of your tips. So thank you again. And for someone who's listening, if they want to learn more about you or, or dig deeper on some of the themes in this conversation, um, where should they go? Um, I would say the easiest place would be to through my LinkedIn profile. I'm not as active on Twitter as, as I used to be. Um, uh, so I would say it's it's just Caesar Ruiz uh, directly on LinkedIn, and I and I typically you know get those and, and respond very quickly to to mo- to everyone's inquiries. So uh, I'd love to hear from anyone who would have additional questions or thoughts that they'd love to learn on it. That's incredibly generous of you. Thank you so much. Um, we will include that in the show notes for anyone who's listening. Um, you can also go to LinkedIn and search for Caesar. It's C E S A R R U I C. Perfect. And uh, thank you so much again. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate the time. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining. And to all of you, thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you next week on the new rules of work. The Muse is the best place to research companies and careers. More than 75 million people each year trust the Muse to help them win at work, from finding a job to building the skills to help them grow and advance. Organizations use our platform to attract and hire talent by providing an authentic look at company culture, workplace, and values through the stories of their employees. You've been listening to The New Rules of Work. 
To learn more about this episode and to research companies and jobs, visit themuse.com. To ensure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you have any questions for The Muse or for host Catherine Minshew, feel free to reach out to press at themuse.com. Thank you for listening. Until next time.